At InDigital, we know that public safety professionals hold themselves to a high standard. In fact, standard doesn't do it justice. In over 25 years working alongside you, carrying millions of calls over our IP networks, your dedication has inspired us. That's why our ESI net goes beyond industry standards, not only I3 compliant, but designed to adapt to future development for a network you can count on when it matters most. Learn more at indigital.net. It is a new day for 911 professionals. They have gone from the most important person you will never see to the most vital piece of public safety. Truth be told, they always have been. The curtain has been pulled back and they are sharing their stories. Welcome to Imagine Listening. Your worst day is our every day by Ricardo Martinez II and narrated by myself, Ricardo Martinez II and distributed by Beacon Audio Books. Copyright 2023. That's right, everyone. Finally, I can let everyone know the rumors are true. Imagine listening. Your worst days are every day is now available as an audiobook on Audible and it's a long time coming. Very excited. Not a lot of authors get the opportunity to voice their own book, but I had the honor and privilege to do so. So thank you to Beacon Audio Books, as well as my publisher titled Town Publishing for everything, but especially all of you for making the I Am 911 movement, as well as Imagine Listening, what it is today. I appreciate you all more than you know. So go ahead, head out, stream it, download it, however you consume your audiobooks. Imagine Listening is now available. If Within the Trenches has ever taught you something, open your eyes to what it is like to be a 911 dispatcher, or has inspired you to become one, then help support us and join our Patreon. Get exclusive bonus content, one-of-a-kind swag, discounts on merchandise, ad-free early access to new episodes, and much more. To join, please visit patreon.com slash WTT podcast. And if you're an industry partner, we have something for you as well. And now for the show. This is Jordan, and you're listening to the Code 7 Podcast Network. Warning, this episode contains the three A's of podcasting, adult content, adult language, and awesomeness. You've been warned. Welcome to Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live there. Hey, what's going on? This is Ricardo with the Code 7 Podcast Network, and this is Within the Trenches, true stories from the 91 dispatchers who live them. This episode is sponsored by InDigital, a leader next-gen core services, and a big shout-out, as always, to subscribers of the podcast. Thank you so, so very much, but also all of you who are watching, listening, sharing, and supporting. I wouldn't be able to do what I do for a living if it wasn't for all of you and your support and what you do on a daily basis, and you're trusting me to share your story. So thank you so, so very much for everything. And as always, there's a lot of stuff going on. It is, it's April 3rd right now at about 10 in the morning. And next week, I'm going to be heading to uh, North Carolina to teach a couple eight-hour uh, days um, for a communications course that I do. And I will be recording episodes with a lot of folks out there doing live broadcasts. We're doing this the week before National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, which is the week to really recognize and celebrate the 911 professionals within the trenches of 911. It's a main week that everyone celebrates, but we also celebrate these folks every single day. So, We've got a lot of that going on. By the time this episode comes out, it'll probably be May <laughs> because there's a lot of uh, powerful stories that are coming to you. And I, I'm just excited to push all of this out to you. And also by that time, this and of course, those who are listening to the audio only, you won't be able to see it, but I'll describe this should be back in stock. 
And this is the official I Am 911 Challenge coin. And it's exclusive to the Imagine Listening sessions. And I'm going to be bringing them to every session, whether it be conferences or the classes that I'm going to be teaching, because Imagine Listening is part of that eight hour course. So the, uh, the challenge coin is back and I'm excited to be handing them out. Um, now I will say really quick before we jump into this episode with my guest, uh, Stephanie, they are not for sale. And uh, I will be creating one, a, a different version that will be for sale. But this specific one, I have been handing them out to those who share stories, whether it's out loud or written uh, during those Imagine Listening sessions. Uh, I've been doing that since 2017. So that's about seven years now that I've been doing Imagine Listening. And it has been an amazing experience. So thank you all of, uh, for all of you who have been there in support of each other and sharing stories. All right, let's get started. I'm excited to have my guest on today. Her name is Stephanie, and she is an island professional out of Georgia. Hello. Hey, how are you? I am doing well. Things are things are good. I'm glad that we're we're getting a chance to do this. Uh, we were going kind of back and forth there on email, but yeah. here we are. And I'm just, I'm excited to have you on here. We were talking right before we started recording and uh, I'm just, I'm excited to get to know you. So uh, let's jump right in. How did you get started in public safety to begin with? Um, it was an accident. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in college and um, later because I have three children. So I'd already had them, they were young. And um, I decided that I was going to pursue a degree in criminal justice because I was going to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. And my professor was also my advisor and he told me, um, you know, you don't have any experience. Like you need to do something in the meantime while you're in school to get some sort of experience. I was like, okay, cool. So I signed up to be an actual ambulance driver in South Carolina. You don't have to have two licensed professionals on the ambulance. One literally can just drive. So I did that while I was going to college and I kind of liked it. So I enrolled in EMT school. And I did that while I was finishing college. So I finished both of them. I got my EMT certification and never really pursued the criminal justice side of it. It just, medical just took me a completely different route. But yeah, it was a completely on accident. Just something to do in the meantime. Oh, man. So I, I have to ask right off the bat. So you're, 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 you said you're driving, right? You were just simply driving. And so... When you're driving during this, I mean, what are some of the things that are going through your mind? Because I can only imagine it's coming from, you know, dispatch myself and hearing, you know, knowing some of the calls that they're going out to, but you are there driving them around and, you know, doing all of this. What was that like for you? I mean, it had to have been kind of a shock to your senses. Well, I started out in general transport. We're just taking grandma to the hospital mm -hmm. for an appointment or to dialysis. But we did have some, you know, emergent calls in the meantime. I have zero training. Um, I was just go. And um, it was terrifying. But they teach you. Mm -hmm. it, well, it even applies in dispatch. It's not your emergency. Right. Yes. So as long as you can keep that in mind, and I got that down pretty quickly, like I was good first couple of days, I was like, Oh my God, what have I done? But <laughs> I'd done it and I'm, I'm not a big person. So, and I'm a female. So I was determined to do it. Like I have to do this. I love that. I, I love the determination and the fact that it was, it was terrifying as well. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're being candid and, and open because, you know, a, a lot of times people won't say they're like, Oh no, you know, I got it. But you can tell yeah. sometimes when someone is saying like, no, I don't, I don't think you did, but you straight up, you're like, no, it was terrifying. And I can just imagine even with some of those, uh, you know, regular transports, you know, from, uh, you know, the, the hospital or whichever to the nursing home or just those, those regular routine things, there are things that can happen. It's just like in dispatch when you start out in your training and you're taking non-emergency calls. And I remember joking with people sometimes because they would say, oh, yeah, you're just going to be taking on emergency calls. Yeah. But sometimes crazy shit happens on those non-emergency lines and you have to work through that as well. So I can just imagine, even though you're doing, uh, you know, routine transports or whichever, 
there was probably stuff that was going on as well, where like you were saying, what did I get myself into? 100%. They're literally the sickest patients that, that you have, mm-hmm. like worse than most people that actually call 911. It's a good learning experience. It was a good place to start. Mm-hmm. So, so I went on. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so what, it seems like it got into your, into your blood pretty quickly. It really did. And my family has no history in public safety. Nobody has done anything. So they're all looking at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, no, no, it's fine. I got this. <laughs> um, so I, like I said, I went and pursued my, my EMT basic while I was finishing my degree, um, past that. So then I was able to go, um, actually help patients work on patients and then go roll over into 911 calls and then i did that for like almost 10 years wow so you have i think when we were talking before you have about 16 years total in public safety right yes so you know you you go through all of that training you end up pursuing uh you know being an emt and such now you are hands on And you're working with folks and uh, so a a little bit of i guess kind of explanation on that as well because now you've gone from the driving you're seeing all of it you go through more schooling and now you're hands-on so what is that like for you as well as now you're working with your hands you're in the thick of it and you're dialing in to this profession well it's still that step was still scary too because you have no responsibility essentially as a driver you're just you know you're driving you help lift and get them in the the ambulance and all Mm -hmm. of that but you're not responsible for their well-being um emt you get in the back now they're your problem everything that happens is on you so that was scary but (laughs) then i don't know i i acclimated pretty quickly that whole it's not your emergency think about what you know work your basic steps and and get through it and that lasted for like a year before i went up to the next level as an intermediate um able to do more things which that shows my age they don't there's not even an emt intermediate anymore in short it doesn't exist (laughs) you can't even you can't be one of those i just grandfathered in and i still am (laughs) (laughs) so if, if for those who are watching and listening who might not know what that actual piece is and and myself included so now what what is added on this next layer this next level of where uh if, what you're working in in this profession um what is it now that you're doing more of i can start ivs i can mm-hmm. give certain drugs um i can be the the high ranking on the truck again this was years ago before there were other things that changed so much mm-hmm. but um i was in charge on the ambulance based on experience and the skill level um and if you need more help. Like if what you can do is not enough, you call for a paramedic and hopefully they're in the area and they'll come intercept with you and meet in the middle. Oh, see that I think would be even more nerve wracking in a sense too, because you're, you're working, you know, fast, you know, you're going yes. through your, uh, like you said, it's not your emergency. It's theirs. You're sticking to your process. You've got everything that you're working on, but now you might need a paramedic. And you're right. hoping that there's someone in the area and that, that I, I guess it, that has to give a little bit of anxiety, you know, just a little, because, uh, you know, in, in a sense, in some, in some cases, because what if the person isn't close enough, you're, you're still doing what you're supposed to be doing. Right. But I kind of feel like you have a, 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 a different opinion to hit well, me with it. Okay. So a lot of the times where I worked on either, because I live on the border of Georgia mm-hmm. and South Carolina. So I've worked both sides of the river. Um, and a lot, most of the time I would be in the, the downtown areas. They were busier. I liked it. Um, and most of the time there was not a paramedic that close because you don't, you don't stop and wait on them. You just go mm-hmm. and you hope that they're going to meet you. And they didn't a lot of the times, but as long in my mind and the way I've coped and got through it is if you've done everything you can, then that's it. Right. You did everything in your power and there's nothing to feel bad about. You tried. See, and I love that right there because unlike in dispatch, 
you're not waiting for that closure piece. You are right there and you're working it. And your explanation now makes even more sense because I'm thinking here for a moment. So you have to wait for them? Like, how does that go? Or, or are you actually hauling ass still mm -hmm. to the destination and hoping that they are able to, like you said, intercept in a way? So that definitely makes more sense. And uh, I haven't had caffeine in forever, so my brain wasn't really working there, <laughs> trying no, to you... trying to piece that together. So, I'm sorry, three dogs. Uh, oh no, you're good. You're good. So that's why you would relay back to dispatch the route that you're taking. Mm -hmm. At least that's how we do it. Um, we tell them we're going this way. So if they were trying to catch us or trying to come from another direction, we would know where to be looking for them. And if we see them, we pull over and they get in the truck, and then somebody gets off and drives their vehicle. But gotcha. just relaying everything to dispatch, it's the, the transition is crazy um, being on both sides. I feel like everybody should get field experience if they can to some extent. It, it makes it a completely different world. It, it bridges the gap, right? It kind of bridges it the does. gap between every single discipline of public safety where you're learning how things work on every side. And, and I, I fully agree that there has to be more of that too, because the, you know, the center that I was working at before I, I left, or I guess retired from the dispatch profession for my career as a 911 professional, um, I'm still in public safety. But when, when I was getting towards the end of it, the newer folks in every discipline of public safety were doing ride alongs and sit alongs and such. And I love that because it helped a lot of those newer, especially, you know, the deputies that would come in and they would sit for a little while and they would, they would listen, or we would have our folks go and do ride alongs or whichever. And again, it, it really did bridge that gap so that when someone was asking questions or there wasn't anything left to question or to chance, we understood how each, um, you know, discipline worked and it just helped out so much better. I'm a, I'm a why person. I want to know why. If you could tell me why, yeah. I can fully grasp it. So I knew why. And I got to know that. And I, I mean, I shared that with, you know, my coworkers and then the people that worked for me once I advanced. Mm -hmm. And I tried to, to get the ride alongs, but it was, it was COVID and then post COVID and short staffing and it didn't quite work out the way that I wanted to. But if anybody's listening and like thinking about doing it, like 100%. From both sides, they both need it, it. It helps, and everybody works together so much better when they know what's going on on the other side. Fully agree, hundred percent. And so you mentioned the transition being being different, <laughs> being being something else. So you know, I, I can just imagine. You know, you are you're, you're working hands on with everything, and now you are transitioning into dispatch where you're not hands-on and you're not seeing you know that the closure piece is kind of missing now what was um i guess what was the kind of inspiration or, or whichever motivation to end up switching over and let's talk about that transition i what did i do I went to work for a doctor's office where I could still do the medical skills and mm -hmm. I was so bored. Like, <laughs> oh boy. Like the, we were busy doctor's office too. Like I didn't get to sit down. There was no chilling, but it was just mundane routine, no excitement. And I was like, this is not who I am. I'm like, but I don't want to go back to 24 hour shift. I'm exhausted. Yeah. Um, we're, pretty busy around here. I don't remember if it's second or third in the state, but we're busy. So I was like, well, what about dispatch? And they were like, sure, come in. And <laughs> so you, did you, did you do that sit along first or was it just no, it was the jump same right in? It was the same company that I was on the ambulance with. So obviously oh. I knew everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> But it should have been a big red flag for me because while I was on the truck, I wouldn't go into the dispatch room. Like, I no, the phone oh. is too loud. It's too busy. I don't want to be in here. I'm leaving. And I pop my head in and say, hey, I'm out. And um, now I'm going to do this. <laughs> I did not know what I was in for. No idea. I, I feel like that's uh, that's kind of a common thing. 
a lot of a lot of folks when they're whichever discipline they're in other than dispatch when they end up coming in it's kind of a, an eye opener because I, I i think a lot of folks unless they've been in there and and sat in there for a while or like really kind of you know want to put the focus on it you just you don't know a lot of folks that I would talk to, they would say, I mean, you just answer the phone, right? I mean, you're just answering the phone. You're sending, you know, the officers, fire, EMS, whichever out. And I would say that's, that's not even, that doesn't scratch the surface. No, like there's close. so much more that goes into it. So, you know, looking back at that time, um, you would poke your head in, say hello or whatever and, and walk out. But now you're walking in as you're going to be working on this side of 911. So, do you remember kind of that first day walking in and seeing everything and thinking this is this is what I'm going to be doing now? I did. Um I was familiar with the areas, I was familiar mm -hmm. with the units, so that was a blessing and a curse because they just my supervisor, I don't want to say assumed because he was right, but like I did know the process of, of who was going where to what and why. So like that kicked out a ton of training. I'd also mm -hmm. been an employee there. So they're kicked out a lot of training there. So I didn't get a lot of sit time just, just until the next EMD class opened up. Um, I remember there was the one particular County that I worked for through that company had five units. Um, at that time, I think there's, there's six or seven in there now. So it just keeps growing. Mm -hmm. um, and in my head, they would tell us to go post if another unit went on a call so we would have adequate coverage. You know, dispatch would tell us where to go. And sometimes they'd mess up. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, how hard is it? There's only five trucks. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was so wrong. So wrong. <laughs> There, <laughs> there are those moments as well. Yes. The, those, that, that realization that there is that much more to it. And uh, I, <laughs> I, 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 I feel the same way. I mean, uh, in the sense that when I very, very first got into, uh, public safety and, and 911 working for the small police department in central Florida, I, the only experience that I had during that time was a show that I loved growing up, and that was Rescue 911 with William Shatner. <laughs> <laughs> that is seriously all I had. I mean, other than, you know, whatever I saw on, you know, maybe the news or, uh, which really wasn't much, right? Because it's just a yeah. news story. And, <laughs> but the other thing too is that, uh, and I say, I say this all the time, but it's the truth all the time. That show, at the end of almost every episode, I remember that Dispatch would meet the people that they were helping. That was part of each episode, each story. And you quickly find out that it's not like that. That's not real. <laughs> that was um, one of the hard things, transitioning and not knowing how it ends. I mean, you can reach out to the crew and ask, but I don't know. If you don't have a good relationship with them, you know, it's kind of weird. Like, hey, what happened? So sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't. And um, the hardest thing was, you know, following EMD. That's not the same as what you do <laughs> in the street. And my supervisor had to keep telling me, you have to take that hat off. You have to take your EMT hat off. You're not an EMT in here. That was such a struggle. Cause I'm like, why, why aren't you giving them this? Like, why, why can't I tell them that? And he's like, you can't, like, that's not what you do. You read this, read this, don't deviate, read this. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> drove me nuts. I got over it, but man, it was hard. I can just imagine. And, and the reason I say that too, is because I, I had a coworker who was similar. He was, uh, uh, he was an EMT, but he was also uh, fire rescue and such. And he ends up transitioning over into uh, dispatch, and it was it was the same. I remember going over there, and for those who are watching and listening as well, who don't really know what we're talking about with EMD, it's emergency medical dispatch is a protocol that a lot of centers use to be able to do medicals. Uh, there are some centers that don't do medicals at all; they only do law enforcement, 
And uh, so they usually will take the pertinent information and then transfer it over to whoever. So like when I first started dispatching, we didn't do the actual medical piece. We would get all of that information. I would send out fire rescue, but I would transfer them to what was called county radio and they would do all of the medical stuff there. So during that time, and it sounds like you had the same thing for EMD, what we would do before they came out with, uh, it's called ProQA, this is the electronic version, it's on the, on the computer, you had a set of cards. and God, The big flip book. Yes, it's a huge yeah. flip book. Oh my God, I don't remember how many protocols that are on there, but it's almost every scenario that 30, you can think of. 31. Oh my, yeah, so there you go. So there's that many cards and you have to ask these first main questions. And depending on the answers of those questions, you flip to the card for that specific uh, type, that medical type. And on top of that, let's just say it's someone who's going into labor. You go to that card and there are several panes of different <laughs> instructions to go through. And for, you know, again, for those who are watching and listening, these are emergencies that are going on and it's fast, 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 fast. So if you can read fast too, that is awesome. But you also, you're also, you have to think about the fact that one ear is listening to everything in the room. The other ear is listening to the person who is on the phone, but you also, if it's, you know, dad, boyfriend, girlfriend, whichever, you can hear the person who's in labor in the background. So you've got all of this that's going on and you have to focus on what it is while still working everything. <laughs> My husband asked me like to this day, he's like, I don't understand how you can do so many things at one time. And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm a mom. And I think that's why or where it started that I can hear all the things. Um, and we were a secondary agency. So we got the transfer in for just medical. So we were only emergency medical dispatch. They were mm -hmm. emergency, is it EPD and then EFD? That's yes. what they did. Yeah. So they'd send them over to us and we didn't have call takers. We were both. So you're listening to your unit. You're listening to the person in labor or who yes. just got shot or stabbed or whatever. And you're still paying attention to what's going on behind you. It, it's a lot. It's, it is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can only imagine folks that are listening or watching this right now, they're probably thinking, this is crazy. Like there's, there's so much to it and there is, but when you get in and you get dialed in, it's, it, it really is a rewarding profession. I mean, there's, there's a lot of crazy shit, a lot of horrific shit that happens in 911, but there's a lot of good that comes from it too. And so I, I always like to make sure to put that out there so that, you know, people don't get scared off or anything, but also if it's in you, like if you feel yes. it, none of this is going to scare you off. You're it, you, a lot of folks that, um, end up coming into this profession, they want to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And it's truly, you know, they're calling, it gets into their blood, just like, you know, it's not, it, it happened with you. It's definitely in my blood. I've tried to do like I said, the daughter's office and a couple other things. And that's just, that's not, it does not interest me. I like the high pace. I like the, the adrenaline fades away, but I still like the study not knowing what's coming next and being able to help. I feel the same way. You know, people used to say to me, you know, how can you, how can you do this job and, and listen to a lot of things that you listen to? I'm like, well, you know, this is, I feel like this is what I was meant to do. And, and, and to help people out, you know, I, we don't do it for the money. That's for sure. Definitely, definitely not. <laughs> we do not do it for the money, but, mm -hmm. um, there, there is a lot of rewarding moments that comes out of it. So, um, you know, going back to this transition piece, um, you know, you mentioned how it was, and, and that was, I'm glad you said it right off the bat, because I was, I was going to ask you that as well about that transition, because you're going from being hands-on with these folks to now being hands-on, but hands-on with the cards, the flip cards. <laughs> and go ahead. We only, we only had to use the flip cards when like the power went out or the system crashed. So uh -huh. thank goodness. I mean, you have to use them for the, the test or whatever. And, um, but no, and they, you know, they don't even have those anymore. It's all electronic. 
it's on like a tablet now and i would prefer the little set of cards over the tablet but then that big set of cards that was the big hot mess yeah i don't know how it is on a tablet but i can see myself like trying to swipe and swiping yeah, past like, and then going back you're like it's not working <laughs> it's awful and you and you know you remember it's in a lot of it's ingrained in your memory after saying it over and over and over again but like pregnancy is one that, that i've never memorized because it can go 12 different ways oh for sure yeah there there's so much to that specific protocol that yeah that one is a, <laughs> is a little hard to to remember but uh you know in reference to like wounds and and, and trying to stop bleeding with a tourniquet and the uh pre-arrival instructions a lot of that stuff i memorized and i remember i was i was at home and <laughs> one of my one of my uh one of my kids friends was over and uh, I, he had he did something to his arm and he just wrapped it up it was very minor but i start telling him the pre-arrival instructions like <laughs> i'm telling him like make sure you put you know firm pressure on it and don't lift it if it keeps bleeding you're not pressing hard enough and he's just staring at me and i'm in my head i'm thinking what the fuck are you doing like you're, you're just, right there with him like <laughs> Right. Yeah. That's and awesome. And I just I remember the the kid looking up at me and he had to have been like maybe six or seven. And I remember him looking up at me and he just goes, Okay, okay, Mr. Martinez. And I was like, just go play. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh yeah. That that stuff doesn't go away. Like I still remember that stuff. And uh, this July will be eleven years since I've been out of actual dispatching, but I've been in public safety for 23 years now. But yeah, that was one of the things that <laughs> that is one thing that I will never forget. And the, the look on the kid's face and me just thinking, dude, what are you doing? Just let the kid go play. He's fine. <laughs> It's fine. He's completely taken care of now. I had to cover all my bases. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Just in case <laughs> got You got to cover everything. Um, so you know, not just that part of the, the EMD piece, you know, th during your transition, but the rest of your training in dispatch, what was that like for you? Was there anything that, you know, kind of surprised you at all? Um, how far, I mean, I knew, I, I knew we were busy. I was out there mm -hmm. in the street, but it didn't correlate yeah. to everything that everybody was doing behind the headset. I, it didn't occur to me that my dispatcher wasn't answering me because she was giving CPR instructions. And if I could just wait a second, it never crossed my mind, not even mm -hmm. once. And um, my supervisor ingrained in my brain that you always answer your units, but if they're just going 10, eight, that's, that can wait a minute. If they're going back in service, that can wait just a second. They don't need an immediate acknowledgement if you're doing something like that. Um, and the multitasking, I, I don't know. It just, it didn't, you're answering the phone you're you're sending the truck it didn't i never thought that there'd be all five phones ringing at one time and you're having to emergency disconnect to get off the phone to pick up the next one while this call is pending to dispatch this truck to hold this person never thought about it that uh that is a, a great description of what it's like because that that is it you've got all of these calls that are coming in and if you, especially if you're the only one, it gets really, really crazy, really stressful. And it's, <laughs> it, it, have you ever seen the movie, uh, old school? No. Okay. So there's, uh, there's a scene in there where, uh, Will Ferrell, he's getting ready to do this debate and he like, he, he twitches a little bit and just just goes just does this explanation like you wouldn't believe and everyone starts cheering after he's done and he 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 moves his head again and he goes what happened i think i blacked out or, or something like that and yes. it almost feels like that sometimes where you're, you're you're working so so fast that when you're when you're done with the call before the next one comes in you're like what just happened i mean you're 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 aware I, i'm over exaggerating a little bit but there's a couple it, times where you're just like, damn, that just happened. <laughs> yes. We, I work, I've worked day shift, I've worked night shift. And on our busy days when we're before pre COVID, um, we'd have four or five people 
on days, maybe three on nights. Um, but that's in a perfect world. And then sometimes it would just be me and another person on nights. There was one particular person I used to work with, her and I, like we didn't have to talk. Like we could do all, do everything. Cause you know, mm -hmm. we're looking at the same screen, but we're dealing with different counties. You don't answer just your county cause you don't know what line it's coming in on. You're just steady answering the phone. And yeah, and then it would calm down for a second and you'd go, oh my God. And then go right back at it. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Or, you know, you're you're having a conversation with your partner or something and you're laughing. Phone rings, you go right into, you know, into that mode. And then as soon as you hang up, you almost finish yep. that laugh that you had and you continue that conversation. Like, <laughs> like, yep. All right. Back to, back to what I was doing. Right. <laughs> oh man. So what, what was it like for you when you first started taking those calls? Now I know, you know, we talked in the beginning that you don't really remember your first call or some of those earlier ones. However, there was something that happened, right? Like they just kind of what was it? You just my, got my the phone, right? <laughs> my director was standing over me. One, I don't like to be stood over. Two, the phone's ringing and like, there's other people in the room. So like, hey, somebody's going to grab it. And like, not this one. The phone rang. It was on the second ring. He picked it up and he held it to my ear. And I was like, ah! and that was it. I had to go. Oh, dude. And launch right into it. I was terrified. I was so mad at him. But he got me over the... The first one, once you, to me, once I got that first one, I was like, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Let's go to the next one. But, oh, I was so mad at him. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wonder, so when we were talking in the beginning, we had, I had mentioned to you that my first call that I took was the first night. Now, I knew that I was going to be taking the next call, and I was wedding to the point where... I mean, and, and, and not to, not to give too much information here, but like down the middle of my back, like that's how much I was sweating. Cause I was freaking out because I had never taken 911 calls before. And here I am on my first night and it's about to happen. Now on the flip side of that, you had no idea that this was going to happen. So in my head, I'm trying to think what would be better. Is it that anticipation, that suspense, almost like when you're on a roller coaster and you're like tick, 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 and you're kind of freaking out a little bit, just oh, here we go. And then you take that first drop or just simply not knowing at all. And bam, there it is. And you're jumping right into it. I don't know. What do you think? For me, as much as I hated him in the moment, like that, that's what I needed. Um, I've done the tandem skydiving twice and you don't get a say in that one either. It, they go and you're going, you don't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> and that works for me. Like it, I don't have to make a decision, like just go. <laughs> so I, I guess everybody's different. I'm sure I could see people completely freezing up. I never did that to any of the people that, you know, were under me when I was a supervisor. And I, I, <laughs> encourage them. Can, can it's your turn? <laughs> right. Go yeah. ahead. And pick, go ahead and pick that up. Thanks. <laughs> so, you how far um, how far along were you in training before that happened? Oh, I had already completed the EMG class. I was certified um, because at that time the center held the um, ACE accreditation, mm -hmm. which also at that time only three hundred centers in the world had it. So um, it's kind of a big deal. So yeah. we're very to the letter. You're not going to freelance this. Um, so they uh, made us wait until we had taken the class. And I think it's what, five days, four days, five days. I'm not sure. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It's, it's not a one day thing. It, it lasts no. like a week. <laughs> like that's how much stuff you have to go through uh, to get uh, that certification. So, you know, you, you had all of this time, that first call comes in and bam, the phone's right there to you. And, you know, there are some dispatch centers that I know. I have some friends at a dispatcher, this one specifically in Michigan, where it's uh, it's an auto ring. And it's 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 not like in, yeah, there is, so there's several people working on the floor and they do police, fire, and EMS. And it's, you can be talking and you'll just hear a boop, boop. And there's oh, the call. No. There's no, there's no other, that's your only warning is those like two beeps 
and then you're in and it's it's random it's not like you know it's we're going down the line oh i've got the next one nope it's I, it's random I don't, I don't think i'd like that very much what if i didn't hear it and i was like mid-story or what if i was being loud what if somebody else is uh, being loud i don't true. know yeah you know you're you're uh, you're you're belting out we are the ch-, you know champions yeah. or whatever and then excuse uh-huh. me hello you're like, um we're we're the champions go ahead what's your wh- where's the address of your emergency oh uh, yeah i don't think i'd like that at all yeah that would that would freak me out um I, and, and when they told me that I, I thought they were joking at first and no they're not joking like that's that's how they do that and they're not the only center i know other centers across the united states that do something similar um but yeah to be to be sitting there especially because you're doing just medicals and i i loved working on phones you know i i loved working on on radios and such and even sometimes running you know warrant checks and and stuff like that but for me, it was either phones or radios. Like those were my favorite spots to work, but to be taking medicals all day, um, if I'm, if I'm dispatching, you know, radios, medicals, I know that's, that's different, but if I'm taking phone calls all day, that's gotta be a hard thing because there, some of those are some of the craziest things that happen. I mean, I, I remember, having a lot of calls that came in where, you know, kids were, you know, choking on stuff or, you know, you're doing CPR or whichever. And man, it takes a toll. It is mentally exhausting. It's far more exhausting than being on an ambulance because on an ambulance, you do one call at a time and it's done. It's over. And dispatch, you are doing call after call after call after call after call. And it, it is draining. And, and I would come home. Hmm? I was just going to say, how many hours is that? Is it what were they eight or 12, 12 hours? 12 hours. We did um, five days on, two on, two off, five on, five off. That five day on by that last day, I was spent. Oh, man. And as you were saying, you were, you were about to say, you know, you would come home and completely overstimulated. Like, don't, don't talk to me. Like, I need, I need to decompress. I don't want to talk. Don't call me. God knows. Don't call me. <laughs> we oh, can text. <laughs> I, don't right. the, I, don't, I don't want to talk on the phone. Yeah. I, 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 that's, that's the part that, that would get me not, not being able to rotate a lot. And, uh, you know, as we were talking, how crazy it is when you're taking these phone calls as well. Um, it's, it's triage, triage, triage on, you know, the, the highest priority to, you know, the middle to the lowest priority, whichever. And like you were saying, you would have to, you know, quickly hang up with one to go to the next one. But if you have, you know, maybe a few on hold or I don't know how it worked with, with you all there, but like for us, um, because we did all, you know, three disciplines of, of public safety, we might have one call. Nobody is there to back me up. I'm the only one to get it. So I have to, I have to make sure that the scene is safe enough that mm-hmm. I can put them on hold really quick to get the next call. But that next call could be a CPR call or that next mm-hmm. call could be a domestic with a weapon. And now you're trying to triage and get back and forth to everyone. And it is nuts. Thankfully, we didn't have a whole lot of putting people on hold. Um, Mm -hmm. We would name, not name, we don't do names, Um, address, phone number, chief complaint, you know, you can't breathe, whatever. Is he breathing now? Yes. Okay. He's awake. Yes. The alert. Yes. All right. Somebody's on the way. And just go. Uh, I could, oh my goodness, putting somebody on hold. They could sit there for a while. Wow. You know, you, you mentioned the overstimulation. You know, when you, when you come home and I I think that's one of the things too, that a lot of people who are not in, uh, public safety, 911, this profession or whichever don't understand a lot. And so if, if there was, if you could tell someone anything about the job that you did, what are, what is one of those things that you would tell them? Like in a bat, like. Somebody that like, wants to do it or like a lay person? Um, you know, even even if it was family. So let's just use this for an example. You know, if, if I could tell you one thing, it would be that when I come home and I'm distant 
or I'm not talking that much. It's not because I'm upset with you. It's more so because I have just dealt with hours worth of people calling and I just need a moment to decompress. Exactly that. I, I, I've been on the phone for 12 hours straight. I have made 4,000 decisions today alone. Just please let me sit down and just be quiet. I'll be okay. Everything's fine. I just need my brain to calm down and the quiet. And then I'm fine. But the five days in a row, it was, that was a little harder, harder to get through. Cause you know, you're home at six, you gotta be work, back at work at six. It, it's a tough, tough profession. And there are not a lot of people who can do it. And, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday I have to I have to get a hold of her and find out where she got this statistic. But she said that only between two and four percent of the population can do the job of a nine hundred and eleven dispatcher. I believe that one hundred percent. And people would come in, and you could pretty much tell out right off the bat whether they were going to make it or not, or whether it was just kind of just not going to be their thing. Yeah, there's there's a there's a feeling, there's a vibe, there's there's a, there's a lot to it. And then that you've have folks too who who might come in that come from a public safety family and feel like, "Oh, I've got this. I've, you know, my brother or sister or whatever is has done this for so long. I know what it is that they do." And then that first phone call and whew, they're gone. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, but I was going to tell you something. I wonder what the like the lifespan because like an EMS they used to say three, three to five years. It's funny that you asked Before they that. left, it I I saw actually yesterday as well. I I was scrolling and I saw someone uh, comment on a post. I don't even remember what the exact post was, but the comment was something to the effect of at least for dispatch, the lifespan is about seven years. Okay. Mm hmm. Seven years and then gone, you know, <laughs> and, you know, they either they, they leave, you know, uh, the profession or they end up you know, moving up or going into a different discipline. Uh, but about seven years is is what this person put. I'll have to look it up as well, because now now you got me thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I think it's probably close. They um, somebody told me that. I think it was not my supervisor, but the one that was before him. I think she said that if you can watch TV, listen to the radio and write down what somebody's saying, that gives you somewhat of an idea of, of how your days go, of what it's like to do it. <laughs> I, I love that also because um, I had a, I had a guest on and we were talking about developing what I call your, your dispatch ear. Yeah. And, and she actually mentioned the same thing. And someone had told me about it when I was first starting out and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try it out. But what she was saying is, uh, that's exactly kind of how you start to build that dispatch here is exactly how you said it. And, you know, if you can, you can type everything while listening and all this other stuff, then you can, you'd be able to, to develop that ear. Yeah, the dispatch ears are definitely a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've been out of dispatch this long, and I still have it. I'll be sitting at a restaurant or whatever, and my my whoever's with me, my eyebrows will go up, and they'll go, what did you hear? Because they know that I do this. Yes. And I'll say, well, like four tables down, this person is in a lot of shit. Like they just got in <laughs> trouble with their, their spouse. <laughs> yes, 100%. I could hear all the things, and I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't want to sometimes, <laughs> right? It's, yeah, it's always there. Yeah, it's 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 hard not to, or it's hard to turn it off, really. Yes, but sometimes, sometimes it really comes in handy. So those are oh, those definitely. are skills. Yeah. Um, so I I, I want to talk to you um, about you know a couple of calls that you know kind of stick with you if you feel comfortable, of course. Um, I, I think you mentioned you you had one from both you know EMS and uh, dispatch. Can you take us through those, please? Um, I'm going to start with my dispatch one. It was 11, 11, 19. Um, I had been doing it for a year and I had a mom call and her 
I think he was one. Her one-year-old wasn't breathing. Um, I can tell you that. I, I could tell you the address. I could tell you everything. Um, it just, it's that stuck. And I walked her through CPR and she was actually listening, whereas most of the time people are screaming and they, you know how it is to get somebody to calm down so they'll actually listen to what you're telling them and do what you're telling them to do so that they can help. She was compliant. She was doing it. And when I heard that baby cry, <laughs> and then I got my unit on scene, I hung the phone up and I walked outside and I cried. Um, I got chills just talking about it. And then and I still have the clip of the recording because I walked out of the room where um, the, the supervisor on scene said, um, the mom wanted to say thank you to the dispatchers for helping and you know, whatever else they said, but yeah, that was my first baby save from the other side. Five two Central. Five oh two, go ahead. Five oh two and five oh seven clear. And the family wishes to thank the dispatchers for their calmness and excellent instructions. Baby's doing fine right now. Well, I'll pass the message along. Thank you, sir. I'm not even sure they went to the hospital. Like, or if they did, I think they went in the car. I don't think they went by ambulance. You, <clears throat> you gave me uh, goosebumps listening to that because the, I, I recently wrote something about uh, kind of what it's like in that moment, and 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 you, come, <laughs> you may you you have me reliving it. And I'm, I'm so glad that you, you shared this as well. So thank you. First and foremost, thank you for, for sharing this story because it, it also shows how connected we get to these callers. You know, you've got these folks who are calling during their literal nightmare and they're trusting in a voice and uh, you are there talking with them. But for people to also understand is we're not drones. Like we're not, we're not just taking this information in the back of our minds. You know, we're freaking out with our callers as well, but it's our job to stay calm, to, to get all of this, but we're empaths as well. We put ourselves in their oh, shoes. Yes. And if you have kids, nieces, nephews, whichever, that, that makes it, you know, heighten up a little more. It goes even more to another level because now you're also almost at the same time picturing yourself. Like, what if this was me going through this and you want to be able to provide the the best help, the, you know, the, the most calm voice for this person who's going through this. And then, like you were saying, you're almost at the edge of your seat, just waiting, just hoping and praying to hear this child make a noise, to to hear something, <clears throat> excuse me, to know that they're okay. And you got that. You got to hear that. And that doesn't, that doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, I, people think it's like TV, you know, oh, they're backing up. Like, that's not how, but this was like TV and I was tearing up and I had to hold it back. Like they were there, like the whole, <laughs> and I don't cry very easy. So I'm like trying not to let her hear it in my voice. And then when he did cry, like, oh my gosh, now I really want to cry. And I don't, I don't get up to walk out, but I had to just breathe. I had to, and that was a good turnout. That wasn't even anything bad, but that will always stick with me. And the, um, the CAD company system that we were running, they were there that day. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what they were doing there, but they were there. So <laughs> I got a challenge coin from them because um, they heard about it. So it was cool. That's awesome. You know, con congratulations on that save. No matter how many years ago it is or has been, congratulations on that because a lot of people, they don't get to experience a save, mm -hmm. um, especially one, you know, like that. And the fact that you had the chance to be able to get up, to go and just be by yourself and just let it go. I'm happy that you were able to do that too, because again, a lot of people don't get that, that chance. And, and the way in the, from everything that we've been talking about, you go to the next one and you go to the next one 
And sometimes it's not until you go home, until you're on your drive home, that everything starts coming out. But by that time, you've probably had several other calls that are hard as well. Maybe not as hard as that one, but yeah. man. I will say that in the center that I worked in, I would go take somebody's console if I heard, you know, something happened or it's it's getting stressful or they had something. Like go. Just go do just take 30 minutes if you need to. Just just walk away. And I feel like everybody was cognitive of that and mm -hmm there was a good rapport as far as that was concerned that everybody got their moment when they needed it. We didn't do the critical stress debriefing that is talked about so much. And I, I do think it's important, um, but we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of our way of coping and we would talk to each other and just to get it out because you can't hold it in. You have to talk about it. Fully agree. And I, you know, the, the way you were, you were saying, you know, there are a lot of places that do have, um, you know, critical incident stress management and they, you know, they go into all this other stuff, but the way you're saying it, I mean, there was support there and, and you all were already talking about it. So you're basically doing it already versus, you know, and any of the other parts. And I love that too, because there are a lot of centers even now that they don't even have that. They don't even have someone who would come over and say, hey, can let me jump on your console really quick. Just go, you know, and take a moment. Things are changing, right? They continue to change. They've been changing for a long time. But in some places, you don't even have that. And I, I love that That's you guys. Horrible. Yeah, right? Exactly. That's you think about good. the shit that That's we do. Horrible. And and there are some people who who don't get that. And uh, or they kind of in a position where there are folks that, or they just feel like people don't give a shit. And maybe that's why a lot of places are short staff as well. Because, I mean, of course, I'm not stupid. There's a lot of different variables. You know, there's money, there's all kinds of different things. But what if that communication piece is a one of those main things that if people just felt like they were welcomed or recognized or supported where they're at, if they felt like someone actually gave a shit, they might stay. I don't know. Uh 100%. And, you know, there's always somebody above you that stops you from getting that to, to move forward. These people have to care. If, if they don't care, then the ones down here are really getting shit on. Right. And a lot of times when, when it, when it starts at the top, and that top isn't like you were saying there, there's a lot of followers. And it's like, well, if they're not doing it, why am I going to do it? And exactly. it just continues this vicious cycle of bullshit and it sucks, but it really does. I'm, I'm glad that where you were at, that you had that, especially during this call, like you said, there was a good outcome, but there was so much to it as well that, um, you actually were able to go and, and have that moment. So I'm, I'm really happy that you had that. Um, now in EMS, you know, before, before all of that happened, there was, there was, there was something that you had as well in EMS. I have so many calls in EMS that I won't say so. There's probably five or 10 that like really stick with me. I can tell you every mm -hmm. single detail, but the one, the most was, um, it was the middle of the night and there was, we weren't the closest unit. Somehow we got dispatched and we were still awake. So we jumped in the truck, you know, otherwise there's a delay of the other crew getting up, putting their shoes on, blah, 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 blah. And then there's your response to life. We were already moving before they could even reroute the other truck. So like, Hey, and it was, um, vehicle accident with entrapment on fire. And sometimes you get there and it is absolutely nothing like what you've been sent to. It's completely different. No, this was exactly that. The um, car had left the roadway and they were merging to get on the interstate and they went up the off ramp and they hit the top of the bridge. And the engine had come into the passenger compartment and they were pinned and it was on fire. 
and they were still alive. And all we had was a fire extinguisher. And um, there was nothing we could do. I told you earlier, do everything you can, and then you can walk away. You no, know, I did everything I could. I couldn't do anything. Um, we had to wait on uh, a special crane to come down and pick the bridge up or the car up off the bridge. Didn't know their names. They went in as John Doe one and two um, in our report. And I didn't go to sleep for the rest of the night. And there's a bridge or a cross by the bridge. And um, my kids can tell you what happened too. They all know the story. And like every time I go under there, like I'll, I'll never forget it. Wow. Now, when something like that happens, how does the critical incident stress management work with that? Like, was there a debriefing for that? Or are you just, you just no. go to the next one? Like you said, you didn't sleep or anything, you know, immediately after that. Um, no, I don't. I know people have nightmares. I know people have mm -hmm. flashbacks. It's not, it's not like that for me. Thank goodness. Yeah. But like, it's still there. It's, it will never go away. I'll always remember it. The sounds, the smells, the everything. Um, but no, I had a good partner. We, <clears throat> we talked, we talked about it later. <clears throat> we talked about it weeks later. I could call him right now and he would remember it just as well as I do. And we talk about it. Um, if, if you don't have the debriefings, just lean on each other. That's all you can do. I think that's one of the things that's important for people to hear is how you just said that if there are no debriefings to lean on each other, that is so important because I, I think a lot of times people are afraid to do so because there is that fear that someone might think, oh, this person can't hack it or this person can't, you know, do this or yeah. that or whatever. So then people just bury it and they just hold it in and, uh, then it's, it gets worse. Then it becomes a problem. Like right. It builds and builds and builds. No talk, talk to somebody. It's for me, I always find more comfort in talking to somebody that that's in public safety that has seen other stuff versus, you know, people that have no idea what I'm talking about or have never done it. Um, I can sympathize rather than empathize. Um, but just talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I agree with you there as well, because I remember one time we had an incident that happened, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'm sure this person is a great counselor and, and does a, a great job, but even he knew that he wasn't in the right spot. We told him, um, you know, what had happened. And the first thing he responds with was, well, how does that make you feel? And so then we just all just kind of, there was three of us. We sat there and we looked at each other and uh, for whatever reason, I was immediately just in their eyes. I could hear them telling me, you need to be the one to tell him. So I'm the voluntold through the eyes, <laughs> <laughs> the speaker of the group. And I turned around and I said, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. And I don't mean any uh, offense or anything. I'm sure you're great at what you do, but I don't think you're the right fit for us because you really don't come from public safety. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I, you're right. And, and then we left, we ended up talking to someone later on that did come from public safety and, uh, it was a way different experience and, uh, it helped. It definitely helped. So I, I definitely agree with you there. Yeah. People that they can't, you can't. I tell you every gory detail and if you've never done it, you can't imagine it. It's uh, like you it's, said, it's in your blood. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's in, in your, your blood. Keep going. <clears throat> it's in your blood and it'll always be there. And, uh, I, I think there's, so there's a lot of people that I've talked to on this program as well, who have, who have left for a little while, kind of like the way you did going into, you know, a different profession, whatever the profession is, but it, they didn't have that feeling. They, it, it didn't have that same thing and they end up coming back. So a lot of times, you know, some folks would just kind of take a break and then they would come back into it and just be completely refreshed and, you know, ready to go again. But there's something about this profession 
that just really gets into your blood and it'll just always be there. We joke and say it's a trauma bond. <laughs> <laughs> I, it could be. I've heard, <laughs> I've heard people say that too. It's a toxic relationship we can't get out of. <laughs> But we love it, so we keep right. doing it. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on today for this episode. We're already over an hour and didn't even feel like we've been talking this long. I I could talk to you for hours. I would have loved to have worked with you, man. This this was a lot of fun. We you we kind of had the same uh, you know, mindset on a lot of this okay. stuff. So this was a lot of fun. I thank you for being on, but I have one last question for you as we go into the wrap up of this episode. And okay. it's not a question that I sent you either. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll it'll be it'll be easy, but it'll, you know, it'll make you think a little bit here as well. Okay. So with all of the knowledge that you have, 16 years in public safety across two different disciplines, with every uh, everything that you have, your knowledge that you have out of these 16 years. If you could go back in time to talk to yourself at the beginning of your public safety career, whether it be EMS or dispatch, what would you say to yourself? What advice would you give yourself? Oh, you're going to make me cry. Um, I would tell myself and everybody else should take it to you. Um, your family, put more time in your family, the jobs always going to be there. Your family needs you. Don't, don't be the one that always signs up for the overtime. Don't be okay with missing all the holidays. If you don't have to focus on you and your family more. Don't let the job consume you. Perfect. Thank you so much for that and for being on and for what you do for the profession as a whole. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to be right back here with you in just one moment. And for those who are watching and listening, if you have any comments, questions, or you ever want to be a guest on the show, you can email us. And that's going to be WTTpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, that is WTTpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, you can follow us on social media. You can become a supporter of the podcast. The easiest way to do all of this is to simply go to links.co slash WTT podcast. And that's links with two eyes.co slash WTT podcast. And you'll find everything there. My email, social media, where to hear the latest episode, but also um, where you can sign up to be a guest on this podcast. So if you're new to the to 911, a seasoned dispatcher, or you're retired, I would love to share your story. I've been doing this for over a decade. It's my passion. It's what I love to do and has been my mission since the first time I started doing this. So I would love to share your story. Hit me up and uh, you can see this on uh, Facebook, YouTube, X, uh, LinkedIn Live, as well as uh, Instagram at times as well. And then uh, you can listen 24-7 on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, your favorite podcasting app, and WithinTheTrenches.net. And this episode has been sponsored by InDigital, a leader in next-gen core services. Have a good one, everyone. And we will see you all in the next one. You just listened to a Code 7 Network podcast. If you have any questions or would like to be a guest on the show, send an email to WTTPodcast at gmail.com.